Hi everyone, it's Joel and Andy on the Stay Hungry podcast. Today we're going to be talking about top tips for lead gen. Andy, back in the game. I know, how long's it been? Years. Well, I mean, this one's probably going out in February. No, I, mean, I, think, oh, okay. I think January, but yeah, yeah, we've had a lot of guests lately. So. Yes, good to be back. Here to talk about lead generation. Steady on. So, what's lead gen? What is it? Well, generate leads, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I know, but <laughs> for the uninitiated. Lead gen, the way we see it, is using paid for ads to get the kind of customer data that is most likely to convert into a paying customer. So, getting information from prospects who are, yeah, the most likely to reach into their pocket and give you money. Uh, traditionally most advertising a lot of lead gen is very cold it's very untargeted so it's basically here's a list of names and numbers but most of them might not be relevant to you at all it's like you could put an ad in the paper which again that's fine and you will reach people who are likely to buy off you but you'll also be paying to reach loads of people who wouldn't buy off you in a million years so we're talking about uh, getting hold of relevant Tangible data. tangible data tangible data so this is born from uh, obviously you and I have been in the marketing game longer than we care to say but combined experience of 40 years let's, that's a polite way of putting it seasoned yeah salt and pepper yeah so um, this is, comes from the fact that marketing and advertising were, were at one point one and the same to an extent and a lot of advertising campaigns other than viewership had no tangible data behind them so in days of old you and i both ran campaigns that used call tracking numbers so you at least knew that that call came from that advert or we would use you know pre-pay-per-click you would use things like um like in the cinema world you would use like number of bums on seats type Mm -hmm. thing to say how many people have seen your ad or readership numbers if it was a newspaper ad but now, with, with digital marketing, people want to know... They don't just want to know how many people have clicked an ad. They don't just want to know how many people have engaged with an ad. They want to know who that person was and how they can get back in touch with them. Mm-hmm. And that's where lead gen is, is a super powerful tool. Absolutely, yeah. Having the ball in your court, having that control is crucial. So it's great if someone, I don't know, someone gives you a call to ask information about your business and stuff, but... You know, unless you can see their phone number on your screen or whatever, they've once they've gone, if they don't make a decision there and then, again, the power's with them. Yeah. Just like people visiting your website, if you haven't got the right kind of tracking in place, you could have loads of people coming to your site and maybe there's some burning questions that they need to know the answer to and those answers aren't easily findable on your website. So they just think, oh, okay, I'll come back later or go and check out someone else. And that's potential sale lost. And again, because you're not the one in control, that, that's that's business gone out of your bank account. Um, and and of course, a lot of as soon as you mention tracking and things like that, a lot of people start panicking and, and and going on about privacy and stuff. So of course, there are wrong ways to do it. But we're talking about ethically doing it. So making sure you have the right privacy policy to inform people that yes, you know, you're storing Google cookies, whatever it might be. Um, and, and Facebook, obviously, that's that's a massive one for us. And sometimes it has to be, well, not sometimes, all the time, it has to be a case of following the facts. There's lots of hoo-ha about data breaches and and privacy abuses on Facebook. Most of it's bollocks. They've got things wrong, of course, but there's some things can be blown out of proportion because, as has always been the case, bad news sells more newspapers. So... You've got to follow the facts rather than listen to what Sally and Scunthorpe says about Facebook. Oh, they're going to they're going to sell your data to everyone. They're going to sell it to the Russians. They're working with the Chinese. It's yeah, and a lot of that was born out of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, yeah. wasn't it? And what people aren't quite seeing, and something that you touch on quite a lot, is if you want to use a free to play platform, so LinkedIn, Facebook, Google Search, YouTube. Uh, Instagram, Pinterest, TikTok, it's not free. Ultimately, it's not free. You are paying to use that through the harvesting of your data. And a good advertiser 
or an ethical advertiser will use that data to show you things you should be interested in. And that's what we're talking about is the value exchange for somebody's details. So for Codebreak, we offer uh, a free marketing guide. So if you visit freemarketingbook.co.uk, we ask you for your name and email address in return for a free, a detailed and valuable PDF that you get for free. And then off the back of that, we'll send you one in the post for free as well. That's the value exchange. You know there's no smoke and mirrors. We will have your name and email address. We'll continue to contact you with uh, information related to what you signed up for. And you'll get that free PDF. That's the way you do it ethically. Absolutely. You're, you're giving, uh, yeah, like you say, fair exchange. You're giving something of value in return for their details. <clears throat> and absolutely, 100%, that if you're, if you're using a free platform you wouldn't watch itv and moan about the advert so the, the way the way you see it is or the way i invite people to look at it is if you're going to use a free of charge service would you you've got to put up with adverts hmm. so would you rather have adverts that are more likely to be relevant to you or just any old advert that might not be relevant to you at all because you are going to get served ads again if you're going to moan about it cancel your facebook account yeah stop watching itv it's the same people moaning about facebook that moan about paying the license fee for bbc and you can't have it both ways yeah yeah absolutely absolutely and yeah the way we do it absolutely fair exchange and and that is if you if you want to get hold of people's data what can you offer them in return so a lot of people especially e-commerce they might offer you a discount off your first purchase they might offer you free pmp like you know the sort of the 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 drink supplier we talked about yesterday (laughs) but yeah I've got free P&P with them because they now visited their website, maybe put things in my cart, but haven't actually purchased. Whereas, you know, we know uh, some quite big e-commerce firms that aren't doing anything like that. You could, you know, what is it, 50% abandoned cart rate? Yeah, yeah, they're not doing data harvesting, they're not doing one-click upsell, they're not doing any of the things that will bring them value. Because ultimately it's going to cost them more to acquire the first customer than that customer will spend. So what are they doing to make sure they extract value from their customer base to initially break yeah, even and abso- then turn a profit? Absolutely, absolutely. So so for e-commerce, to be honest, it should be really easy. But even for B2B kind of companies, is there a lead magnet? Maybe you could do a discount as well. Will um, For our clients, maybe it's a case of designing a free PDF, designing a free fact sheet. So if you want to know the five things you need to look out for when buying a used car, Give us your name and email address and we'll send you that fact sheet. And then, of course, we will stay in touch with you about our used car dealership until you either say, no, I don't want to hear from you anymore and hit unsubscribe, or you go and buy a used car off them. Um, So lead magnets can work really well. And we'd say if you're thinking about lead gen ads, then, you know, you might be able to get all the information you need into the ad itself or you might want to split test that with driving people to a landing page. We'd say that if what you're trying to convey is quite meaty, you know, all the benefits of what you're trying to trying to give away or offer, then you might be better off having a landing page, a page solely dedicated to basically what, what you're giving yeah. away, what, what you want. Um, and, and follow the numbers. A lot of people, they make assumptions. And obviously, anyone who's watched Under Siege 2 knows what assumption uh, assumption is the... The mother of all fuck ups. There we go. I thought you were going to let me finish the sentence. Oh uh, right, so, sorry. I was just thinking about should I swear, but then I thought well, actually, I've probably swear quite a few times on this podcast. Haven't we? Well, I always drop my blade quote in, don't I? Uh, so. <laughs> what did he pop out? Where's the snipes in the new Kevin? Yes, thing yes, film yes on a series, Netflix. isn't it? Yeah, is it it's, meant ba- be, it's meant to be good. It's loosely based on Kevin's life, isn't it? Oh, so, uh, yeah. okay. I'd like to see that. Kevin yeah. Hart, I should say. I don't know him but on first name terms. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Kev. so testing and measure is something we talk about a lot, that uh, people make assumptions or um, they make assumptions based upon what they own, what they like themselves. And, and we encounter that a lot. So for example, you might be a business owner who, I don't know, receives a lot of shit in their inbox. And to be honest, as business owners, you probably do we get a lot of spam. So your thoughts on email frequency might be different to someone who doesn't receive so much shit yeah, in their inbox. Yeah, of course. So if you're like, I don't like being emailed more than once a month by a company, you're going to struggle if you apply that to your own email marketing. Because if a business came to us and said, oh, Andy, Joel, I'd like you to take care of my email marketing, but I don't want you to email my database more than once a month, we'd be like, 
thanks but no thanks and some people are up for listening other people aren't we know, we know that yeah and I think this is a topic that comes up a lot with lead gen so the places where you'll generally generate uh, a value exchange so be able to get people's email address and name chances are they initially signed up for those platforms with their personal email address so there's pros and cons to that the pros being if they move jobs your that information is still valid you can still get in touch with that person so maybe you were a supplier for them um at one job and they moved to another company and you could go with them that's so that's cool um obviously the con being that you might not know what company they work for initially but you've got to think about it from What's the best way to communicate with these people? Now, the best way to communicate with me is not in my work inbox because my work inbox, I am only glancing up and down it for customer names or prospect names mm-hmm. because ultimately they're, they're my priority when I'm at my desk. My personal inbox is when I'm sat down in the evening, I'm relaxing, I'm consuming information, I'm reading things, and that's where you can start to tell your stories. That's where you can actually start to get into someone's psyche and that, become relatable for them and you'd be surprised well you won't be surprised if you're listening to this as a business owner but I would say most of my decision making as a business owner is done in that period where I'm relaxing and flicking through things and exploring where you don't feel guilty for not working or when I'm walking the dog so it'll either come from a podcast when I'm walking the dog or reading through my personal inbox when I'm relaxing I mean especially if you're using um, a specific lead generation ad where the form is pre-filled for you. Chances are you've signed up to Facebook, for example, with your personal email address. So that's the one that's automatically going to appear in the form. With LinkedIn, it's probably going to be different. Probably use your work email address. But if a company name is vital information for you, then that's something else you test and measure. Test and measure a form that makes the the company name a compulsory field against a form that doesn't make it compulsory. Yeah. Because if people are happy enough to give their company name, then happy days, you save yourself a lot of fanning about. It's like we have, um, uh, we've done quite a few tests on phone numbers. Now, I think a lot of marketers would say, oh yeah, people don't want to give their phone numbers away. But if you've got your targeting right, and your positioning right as a trustworthy business, you might be surprised how willing people are to give their phone number. Yeah, and that's, Historically, that wasn't always the case. So as a, as a marketing business, that's come as a nice surprise to us that we've now got campaigns running that ask for people's phone numbers that actually cost less than when we don't ask for them. I mean, what kind of cost per click are we getting at the moment for some clients? Well, our own. Cost per lead, our mm. own at the moment is £2.28, which, if you know about lead gen, that's seriously... Are we doing something similar for, well, a B2B client with a phone number? Yeah, and... Ultimately, the leads are much more valuable to them with a phone number because what they're trying to explain is would be quite hard to explain in a series of emails. Mm-hmm. So the quicker they can get on the phone to someone and say, oh, you signed up for this and I just want to check how you're getting on, mm-hmm. the quicker they can spark up those conversations. The problem with phone numbers is where if your intentions aren't genuine, it can burn you very quickly. So you have to be certain that when you make that call that you're not ringing them just to sell to them, that you're ringing to make sure they're getting on okay with their lead magnet, mm-hmm. to make sure they understand everything. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the phone had went through a period of, of like quite, having quite a bad reputation, um, but now I would say that is, that is changing. And let's say, well, the, the proof's in the money that more people are now more than happy to give their phone number away. But also, it does offer... Um, marketers and business owners the opportunity to to market by by sms yes uh, now of course loads of people in terms of using direct message they'll use instagram they'll use snapchat they'll use facebook whatever yeah. but good old text message marketing we're seeing that come back and work really well for some clients as well um because well you you mentioned your inbox you just scan up and down and and some people you know we're well, we're quite tight about what we allow in our inbox, but some people, they'll have hundreds of emails and you've got to stand out amongst that, which is why for our clients' emails, we spend so much time working on the subject header to make sure, you know, the timings of the email to make sure they stand out and, and appear when there's not much competition. Yeah. But when you get a text, the open rate's pretty much 100%. Yeah. So that's something that's... Well, like, Yeah, and particularly in the kind of 25 to 55-year-old bracket which is probably probably your business sweet spot in terms of because i 
I can't comprehend, and I know I'm weird, when I go to someone's inbox and they will happily have 100 unread emails. That blows my mind. My daughter. My daughter is quite particular. I was like, Mads, how, how could you have like 150 unread emails? Oh, I'll just check them when I can. And it's like, oh my God, what, what freedom. Yeah, <laughs> and, and some people have the same attitude to text messages and WhatsApp. And that blows my mind that I can text, I mean, the people in our team, I can text mm. on WhatsApp. And they can leave that four days unread. And I know that my generation don't do that. So play, play the numbers. Basically. Yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. So it's, it's really important that if you are running lead gen to do that testing and measuring, but to, yeah, to know the best place to start. And to, what's the kind of vital data for you? For most people, it's just an email address. For other people, I'd like to know their first name and, and surname, or I'd like to know the company they work for, their mobile number. And, and so it is important, but again, follow the numbers and i know we talked about ads a lot but if you're if one of your goals is to acquire potential customer data then paid for ads will trump organic if you're looking to seriously build your database via organic marketing alone it's doable of course it is and there are ways to do it and and to make it work for you but it's still going to be like 10 percent of what a paid for campaign will do for you so so what are the key ways to keep that cost per lead down because that's what we're talking about here isn't it is that leads are valuable yeah. But well, I'd say out of most of the ad accounts we take over clients, it's staggering how how few audience groups are being targeted. So if the ads aren't as targeted and relevant as they can be, Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever, they they punish you as it were by bumping up the price. So if you if so you're you, being too broad, is that what you mean? Being too broad or, or getting it wrong. If Facebook think you're trying to target the wrong people. That they they are going to punish you, and I know some of the campaigns we're running for clients. There's up to sixty ad variations, whereas we've taken over ad accounts where there's one, one or two. Yeah. So it's like, well, I I want to um, I'm opening up a gym, right? And it's going to be basically mo- mostly blokes, and it's got a budget gym. So I'm going to target blokes aged twenty to forty who live within twenty miles of the gym's location. And I bet there are companies, marketing companies and gyms running ads like that. No no more specific than that. Yeah, yeah. And they well, might as well just put an ad in the newspaper by that approach. Yeah, I mean, to give away one of our secrets. Just all steady on, steady on. <laughs> We do run a broad audience on all of our campaigns because you have to test a broad audience. But? But we also run an in- what, what I've literally labelled incredibly specific audience so that we compare the cost per lead from a broad audience, like the one you just described, with an incredibly specific audience. So in that case, it might be men aged 25 to 30 who read muscle and fitness and work 9 till 5, but always exercise in the morning and have two dogs and tend to wear Gymshark. Speaking of which, Martha's just told me that she's done a, doing Arnold presses with 14 kilo dumbbells. And a shit, I didn't want to tell her, shit, I only was 12. <laughs> pretty impressive stuff so they're the seated presses aren't they yeah seated back straight yeah straight up, yeah up together this down. is a podcast so you yeah i don't you, know why i'm doing, doing that doing i am doing the demonstration the yeah. yeah um that's pretty impressive stuff i would not upset that girl no if we want shit doing uh, we usually get martha to do it don't yeah we? If, if you're a prospect of ours or a client i don't mean or, like shit as in like and particularly if you're a supplier of ours if martha calls you my <laughs> advice would be Put the phone down because it won't be good. <laughs> yeah, if we had hotel rooms booked and and we think there's a better deal, it's probably Martha will ask to call the hotel. Yeah, I'd say yeah. She, one, she's... One, one supplier let us down once, and I think Martha had worked here for four weeks, and she said, "I'll deal with it." And honestly, I've never been so scared in my life. <laughs> Everyone needs a Martha in their team, but but you can't have ours. So um, capturing data, right? It's brilliant. It gives you control. You have data to use, to mine, to track, to serve, maybe follow-up ads to. But this is the important thing. You have to have that follow-up process. If you think having, oh, look, I've got 100 people now in Excel or in my email database. They're not calling, Joel. They they haven't become customers. The, The leads must be shit. No, 
you've got to have a detailed sales process yeah what is what is your process because if, if you're selling something that's i know maybe you're selling a service it's quite cheap right that's one thing if you're selling a service that's pricier there's gonna be more nurturing involved yeah so i i screenshotted tanya robbins sales process the other day didn't i just, mm, that's just good. interesting to show the team and so if you think of it as four segments segment one which is the the open bit of the funnel is the lead gen it's getting people's details in the first instance now if you, you follow any kind of business gurus lifestyle gurus chances are you've been served a tony robbins advert in the past and normally it will be like download my free guide to mastering success in 2022 something like that the moment you sign up to that you get put in his funnel and you go into stage two of his sales process which is then getting you to book onto a free webinar or uh to, with one of his team yeah so, free call one of his coaches that's the ad that i'm getting yeah. served at the moment yeah so then they will continue to tag you with that so that's the first trip wire which is a term in marketing for what you do with a lead to get them used to the idea of engaging with your business the next stage is that they have a low level spend something so in tony robbins's case it will be buy buy my email funnel and you can buy his email funnel to then use as your own or it might be uh come to my three-day webinar on mastering your mindset and it will be a quite a low ball price so we're talking sort of 250 pound 297 yeah, dollars about, about say the one i've seen it's about three four hundred dollars yeah three day yeah. online thing yeah on that three day online course which will be valuable you will get your mm. money's worth otherwise this process doesn't work they will offer you to become one of his ongoing clients so whether to come on his course in america whether to go work with one of his mm-hmm. coaches and that's where you move from tripwire to high ticket that in a very simple way is a sales process that's how you go it's not just getting somebody into an email funnel and asking them to do the first tripwire it's what calls are those people getting in that period? What adverts are they being retargeted with? What offers are being pushed under their nose? What what, else, what other value can we give these people to make them more likely to become a customer? Because and and the reason we're saying this, if you're all thinking this sounds like common sense, is that some businesses will pay sometimes a lot of money to acquire leads, and then Do their nothing. idea of a sales <laughs> process is to maybe call them up once. Oh, there's no answer. Leave a voicemail, and that's it. No yeah. ongoing emails, no text messages, no return phone calls, no no invites to book a call via a diary link, no ad retargeting, nothing. So, in the recent past, we've worked with a client whose average sale is one hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Cost per lead for that client was six pounds, wow. and they would ring those leads a couple of times and then give up on them. So they wanted people to go from a value exchange of £6 to a value exchange of £150,000 in a phone call. That's, that's, that's how naive some businesses are about this. The maths don't stack. I mean, that's... Yeah, it's... it's so bo- Now, it's, it's a horrible phrase. We need to think of an alternative. But the old sales phrase is buy or die. You stay in touch with people. Because th- at the end of the day, right... Unless you bought a list cold, these people have stuck their hand up to say, yes, Joel, I'd like your free PDF on how to create marketing with yeah. sales. They're interested in what you're offering. Yeah. So it's your job, our duty to serve those people until they either say, can I talk to you about using your services? Or actually, I don't want to receive yeah. your stuff anymore. But either way, you stay in touch with them until one of those two decisions are made. Exactly. So like our vision is to help people and have fun. That's, that's the key element mm-hmm. of our business which means that if someone's put their hand up for our guide, I'm going to continue to contact that person and try and help them until they tell me they no longer want my help anymore. Serving is selling, Joel. And that, but that, that. That's, the psychology of that is, is great, isn't it? Because my main driver isn't to extract money from that person. My main driver is to help that person, which in turn may mm-hmm. mean some value for me. But if, if you only ever... Uh, give to receive this this whole process doesn't work yeah that that's um that's so true it's we've realized we can't help or we certainly can't help as well businesses who who were after the money first and i remember, I remember as a kid do your parents always used to tell you at christmas 
You don't give to receive. You're like, what a load of bollocks. And then, like most things, you grow up and realise, shit, my parents were right all along. And we, we were having this chat yesterday, and I think we'll be safe because your anniversary will be long gone by the time this podcast goes out. But when you actually think of a nice gift for someone that they genuinely really want, you look forward to them receiving it. Yeah. And and the only exchange is their joy, which, in fairness, you know, it's a big ego boost really? when you make someone else feel happy. But if you take that attitude into into business, and not in a naive way where... We're all in to make money. Yeah, yeah, we've got bills to pay. But if you if you can genuinely help people and genuinely solve a problem for them, th- money doesn't become part of the conversation because you're doing what they need and therefore it's worth it. Yeah, absolutely. So having a follow-up process, really important. Um, like if you're, to be honest, if you're going to spend money on any kind of advert, if you're going to be spending money on advertising in the paper, the cinema, Sky Smart, whatever it might be, what's what's the plan you know if you're if if the goal of i don't know you're running an ad in the newspaper and the call to action is to phone who's manning those phones if someone's reading that newspaper in the evening and they call up have you got a call answering service you're paying for or is it just a standard voicemail i mean i'm bold over how many businesses still have a standard bt or ee greeting welcome to orange yeah, answer phone they haven't even been asked so shit have i got the right number i don't know it's like old orange doesn't exist anymore who got who bought orange? EE, yeah, yeah. And EE's now O2. No? There was, was O2 there was, some, there was something, wasn't there? Yeah, some, yeah, yeah. It's terrible. Um What was he in the I saw him in something the other day, the guy from the Orange ad. What, the Futures Bright, the Futures Orange ad? Oh. Man in the High Castle. Yeah, he's um he's one of the main characters in that. Have you seen that? No. The Nazi thing. I know what it is. Oh, that's awesome. Really cool. I've got a bugbear that one I raised on the podcast. It's not about Nazis, and not subject for the no, no, it's about return on investment. Unless it's raised a lost ark, of course. <laughs> no, it's about return on investment. Oh, okay. um, if you go into a lead gen campaign, mm. there's multiple ways to measure your return on investment. So you might measure it by uh, number of leads, you might measure it by spend from those leads, you might measure it by increased business activity you might measure it by increased number of inbound phone calls um but it's really important that when you do this if you're if if in the very very first instance you're trying to measure your return on investment by how much bigger your business is revenue wise Mm -hmm. you're probably going to be disappointed it's not how it works to start with and actually you need to look at the health of your business how many qualified leads have i got today that i didn't have yesterday and then how many qualified leads have I got the next day that I didn't have the day before? And look at the growth of that first. Mm-hmm. Then you look at how many of these qualified leads am I in active conversations with? How many of these qualified leads am I in closing conversations with? How many of these closing conversations am I actually closing? And you, it's the, the, the minutiae of, of the situation yeah. that you, uh, you need to understand. And Absolutely. Cause it's, it's hard to put a price sometimes on... Not just growing, growing your brand, but like protecting it. Like so, one of our packages, funny enough, is called Grow and Protect, and a, a massive benefit of growing your email database of, of relevant people. Again, the people most like to buy off you is should you come a cropper with any of your preferred social media channels, you haven't put all your eggs in one basket. So if your if your business model is entirely dependent on Instagram, yeah, and suddenly somehow you've broken their terms and conditions and Instagram delete your account or, or whatever it might be. If you've got a massive bank of email addresses and mobile phone numbers at your disposal, all is not lost. It will be tough, sure. But yeah. so many businesses don't have a database and certainly don't have a database they look after, which which we all saw in March 2020 when businesses... <laughs> I got 3,000 yeah, photocopier emails. It's like, it's like, oh shit, lockdown. Oh my God, unprecedented. I'd better start contacting that database I've never contacted before. And suddenly you just think, who, who are these guys all sending me information? So there's an easy tip straight off the bat. If, you're, if you've got a social media platform and you've got a good number of followers, figure out a way to get those followers' phone number or email address, whether it's set up a WhatsApp group, Facebook group, whether it's um, running a competition, whatever it is you can do, to get those people's details so you can take that conversation off social media and protect yourself as a business. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that control thing. And, and it's hard to say control without having negative connotations. But 
if you're dependent on third parties, and to be honest, most businesses are partly dependent on some third parties. Yeah. It's it's just it's just spreading the risk because say if Instagram does work really well for you, then, then fantastic, milk it while you can, but also be aware that right, okay, what if it goes down? What if I get banned? Um, and again, as well, I said one of my mentors, you know, he um, he Instagram Live worked really well for him. But for some reason, he doesn't know why he, he got banned from doing Instagram lives. I might know why. And uh, well, well, I can make I, I can make a guess as well. But um, he's got like I think like thirty thousand email addresses and, and and mobile numbers. So he's back doing lives now. So he must have sorted it out with Instagram. But he he was okay. He was covered because he could still send emails. He could still send text messages out, and he covered his bases. Yeah, and but... that's yeah, that's that's important. Uh, but but something a lot of people struggle with is it is really that frequency that that is important because we were talking this morning weren't we about typos and email addresses and and to be honest most people don't seem bothered by typos these days anyway but for us it's it's still important um but some people focus maybe so much on the details they don't look at the bigger picture and for emails and and it goes text message marketing and most forms of marketing if your frequency isn't right it isn't going to work for you. If it, we talked about sending emails once a month, if you're running Facebook ads, but you're doing like an ad that you run for a couple of days, if you're um, thinking about doing newspaper advertising and you run an ad for one night, that shit just isn't going to work. You need to be in front of people more regularly because there's so much more noise out there. Until someone's complaining that they're seeing you too much, you're not doing it enough. That's a really simple gauge. And I don't mean your mum. I mean, someone, one of your peers or one of your target audience. Until you hear, I can't get away from your stuff and it's of no relevance to me or it's of no value to me. Alarm bells should not ring. You're not being frequent enough. Mm. And I'm yet to meet a business that I think is too frequent. And we know businesses that between emails, Facebook group, WhatsApp, text messaging they probably are in touch with their database twice a day mm-hmm. and i can envisage sometimes you're in a bad, <laughs> bloody bad mood and you think oh fuck's sake what do they want now but generally speaking again if you're serving them well not spamming them you're serving them you're giving them information of relevant entertainment value whatever it might be you're unsubscribe late the people who unsubscribe are never going to buy off you again anyway yeah 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 which is another hard way to look at it, but it's the truth. So you sound like a man who knows what he's talking about. What's the uh, what's the next step if someone wants to get in touch with us? If you think that lead generation would be good for your business, then visit cobreak.co.uk and simply book a free discovery call with myself or John. Nice. Catch you again, guys. <laughs>